And welcome into Who's Number One. I'm Trey Wingo. You know, usually we celebrate the best, but this time we're looking at the worst. It's called losing it. Veins popping out, face turns red, the air blue with profanity. Hide the good China, because here it comes, a wave of anger. There are players and coaches who haven't learned how not to lose it, who need an emotional rescue. ESPN Classic now presents the 20 greatest anger management failures of all time. 2020. Volatile, unpredictable, and savoring the spotlight, Dennis Rodman is a prime example of the need for anger management. You didn't know what to expect when Dennis went on the floor. You didn't know who he was going to fight or if he was going to elbow somebody. And he is qualified, and that will be a flagrant. He pushed him, shoved him, stepped on him, grabbed him, pulled him down, hit him in the back of the head. That's what everybody liked. What's on the menu tonight? We're tied at 71. He was upset. He got jabbed or poked and didn't realize it. He just reacted. He blatantly kicked the guy and down he goes. I think a lot of us have done this. You know, done this. You know what I mean? He got him underneath the leg and in his groin. When he had that incident, we had verbally agreed with Converse on a three or eight million dollar deal. That deal evaporated instantly. We smell lawsuit. The police were going to deposed Dennis, there was going to be a criminal investigation. Six days after the January 15th, 1997 incident, the Minnesota Timberwolves cameraman dropped assault charges, but not until Rodman agreed to a financial settlement of a reported $200,000. The NBA suspended Rodman for 11 games and fined him $25,000. He really had done something we'd never seen before. And there goes the cameraman. If you do something with fans or with the media, that's a whole different story. That's just, you just can't get into that. And then he made fun of kicking the dude. He's like, yo, maybe I'll send him some flowers or something. DR does not care. He will go ahead against anybody. He'll probably kick your grandmother. <laughs> problems with National League umpires this yeah. year. I've always wondered how much of Lupinella was crazy and how much of Lupinella acted crazy. <laughs> he lost his guard. It's a cry for attention, I believe. I believe he wants the focus on him. Certainly the focus was on him when he was throwing that base around. Lupinella has never been one to hold back his emotions or his penchant for rearranging things. On August 21st, 1990, managing the Cincinnati Reds, Pinella boiled over onto the field to object a call at first base by umpire Dutch Rennie. Perez and Pinella argue. You're, you're in the guy's face, and you're doing the bobblehead, and you're really seeing it. What is there to do? There's a base. I think I'll rip it out and go throw it somewhere. I mean, Pinella's giving you a show. Pinella's trying to fire up his team. Maybe that was kind of like a little bit of a motivational tool that Lou had. And uh, nobody threw a base better. That's a suspension there, too. It's good antics, and it's great showbiz. And I think Pinella knows that. There's a hothead. But Pinella is not nasty. Some of these other guys can be nasty, be a bully. That's not Pinella. I don't think it had ever been done before. You know, sort of like one of those milestones, the four-minute mile. If you can find me a piece of footage of anybody before Lou Pinella with the presence of mind to rip the base out and throw it, I'd like to see that. Eight, eight. This was not the spur of the moment thing. Uh, this, this was leading up to something. Now the corner of my eye I caught this ball-headed guy going down. Seymour steps way out of line. It's this WWF moment dropped into an American League Championship Series. On October 11, 2003, Pedro Martinez and Roger Clemens, notorious for buzzing batters inside, were matched up in game three. Martinez plunked the Yankees' Kareem Garcia. Why is it always like sometime replacement guy who wants to start trouble? Like if it's Jeter who's gonna start, you know, then you go, okay. But guys like Kareem Garcia, what? I have no respect for that guy. Who are you, Kareem Garcia, to try to test Pedro Martinez? In my heart, I've seen him take some real shots at people. And the one he threw at Garcia just triggered him. Clemens retaliated in the fourth inning and both benches emptied. Yankees bench coach Don Zimmer charged Martinez, 
who was 41 years younger. When I started out of the dugout, the only man I had in my mind was Pedro. He could have really hit him with a quick two-piece, like bomb bomb, but he had respect for the Zimmer. All he did was, you know, he helped him go down already. We didn't know really what had happened. We were all scared that maybe something had happened to Zim, like he had a heart attack. We were worried for him. You know, his chest was, you know, breathing real hard, and uh, his eyes were kind of lazy. He's got a big old whelp on the side of his face. He didn't really know where he was at, and he, he said that, you know, Pedro had hit him. You know, Zim, were your eyes like, Malara, I love every one of you, son of a gun, but I can't stand that blankety blank. Um, by no meaning, I want, I want to hurt the guy that's my daddy's age. Pedro was fined $50,000, and an apologetic Zimmer of 5,000. Well, I got bad legs. 72 years old at that time, I was just, I was gone. I, I, I couldn't get up if, if I tried to get up. 17, 17, 17. I don't know if Jimmy Connors was the first tennis punk, but he took tennis punkdom to a new level. You are an abortion, do you know that? He screamed obscenities, he gave the finger. He did all the punk stuff. There's a part of Connors you love, because Connors is a tremendous competitor, gave everything he got every time he played, but Connors had another side to him. Listen, kiss me first before you do anything to me next time. Please kiss me. He cared, and he showed that he cared, and sometimes when you care too much, it, it, things just come out that, that uh, shouldn't come out. On February 21st, 1986, against Devon Lendl in a semifinal of the International Players' Championship in Boca Raton, Connors wants a call, a lot of folks in the crowd want a call, he's not going to get it, Jim. Jimmy Connors raged about a line call and capped a contentious series of disagreements with a sit-down. Enough playing under those conditions. Get the supervisor out here. He sort of had a darker, more brooding quality to his anger than McEnroe. McEnroe was always kind of comical about what he did. I think there was an inferno inside of Connors that was always burning, and if it got too bad, you just never knew what was going to happen. Well, Connors is going to pack his bags, and that's it. I can't believe that Connors is walking off. He knows the rules. Losing three to two in the fifth set, he forfeited the match, left to cheers and applause, and was fined five large. Connors had what I call Irish Alzheimer's. He would forget everything except his grudges. 16. If there's one thing Kenny Rogers detests more than unsuspecting water coolers, it's unsuspecting cameramen. Why do you attack a guy who can get video evidence of the attack? I think if they made him pay for those cameras, they wouldn't do that so much because they're expensive. On June 29, 2005, when the Rangers came out for their pregame stretch, Rogers was in no mood for his close up. This is, you know, 2 o'clock in the afternoon before an 8 o'clock game. Come on, our life's too short. What are we so upset for? Relax, take it easy. Kenny Rogers is too stupid to understand. He doesn't make his money off ticket sales, he makes it from television. I sort of wish that four or five cameramen caught Kenny Rogers in the players' parking lot coming out late after everybody else had gone. For shoving two TV cameramen and knocking one of their cameras to the ground, Commissioner Bud Selig suspended Rogers for 20 games and fined him 50000 after the Players Union filed a grievance. An arbitrator reduced the suspension to 13 games. He's old. You know, you get crabby. He's like uh, the guy that is what you walk on his lawn. Rogers doesn't like the media. He's not a big, big game pitcher. He chokes constantly. Rogers is a clown. <laughs> Kel Yarbrough had two settings, on and off. There was no halfway setting on okay. Kel. He got out of the race car and he'd be very angry because he finished second, you know? Most guys would be thrilled. Kale's over there throwing his helmet and kicking the car and mad because, you know, he, he didn't win the race. On the last lap of the 1979 Daytona 500, Donnie Allison and Kale Yarbrough were running 1-2 when their fenders kissed. Meanwhile, Richard Petty had gleefully sneaked across the finish line first. They fought, and Donnie's brother Bobby drove over to join the fray. The rumor is is that Posty was given the finger, flipped the bird by Yarbrough. Not happy about this. And Kale yelled, 
that the wreck was my fault. And I think I questioned his ancestry. And he hit me in the face with his helmet. So I climbed out of the car, and Kale went to beating on my fist with his nose. I'm surprised that there aren't more fights. I mean, those guys are out there, and they're banging against each other in situations unlike almost any other sport where they can kill each other. So I'm surprised that more drivers don't get out of their car and, and clobber the guy who put him in the wall. I had finished 11th in the Daytona 500 in 1979, and my part of the winnings were not enough for me to pay a $6,000 fine. In the NBA, the referee is the authority figure. Dennis got a technical foul. He's out of here. Dennis is out of the game. You don't tug on Superman's cape, you don't spit in the wind, and you don't headbutt referees. Oh, no. Uh -oh. That looked like he headbutted him. The Worm returns for an encore performance. On March 16, 1996, tagged with his second technical. A horn, the rebound, and a foul coming up. I believe it's going to be on uh, Rodman. And now Ted Bernard is throwing him out of the game. Dennis Rodman not only gave referee Ted Bernard a piece of his mind, but a piece of his forehead as well. But Ted Bernard, oh, and he, oh, 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 oh. It looked like he had butted him. I think it's a good thing Dennis didn't have any of his piercings in at the time, because that guy could have been really hurt. I don't think it's anger with Rodman as much as it is just, you know, Dennis Rodman, the showman and the self-promoter. He throws his jersey back at a court, very upset. He thinks it's part of an act. I don't know how angry he actually is, more so than just getting his name in the paper. If you want to suspend me, suspend me. Make an example of Dennis Rodman. I don't care. The NBA suspended Rodman for six games and fined him 20000 Because the Bulls were winning and they were back in championship mode, nobody around here seemed to care whatever he did wrong. Bill shaking his head, saying, well, you know, you do things that the rascal down the block would do. <laughs> when you were a kid, there was always a rascal around. Dennis was a town rascal. I think it's great for the sport. It adds a little more aroma. 13, 13, 13. I think the first picture that comes to my mind when I think of Earl Weaver is him out there, toe to toe with an umpire, and like kicking dirt on the shoes or on the plate. Earl was always up for an argument. He would have these rhubarbs. Rhubarbs, that's a word that you don't hear much anymore. Nose to nose with an umpire, turning his hat backwards so he can get right up close. Earl Weaver was a master at confrontations, earning 98 ejections in his Orioles career, a record for American League managers. On September 17, 1980, Weaver lit into Bill Hallam, unaware that the umpire was Mike. You run yourself, Earl. You run yourself. Finger off. You hit me. And there was never any time limits on these arguments. Nobody ever says, OK, Earl, wrap it up. Baseball, the timeless game. Well, it's nine innings, and there's no clock. You do it again, and I'll knock you right in your nose. Hey, there's an argument. The manager's out there. He's not going to win the argument. No, you're lying. But boy, he sure is going at it. You are a liar, Earl. You are a liar. This is beneath the level of two third graders going, your mother wears army shoes. Yeah, who says so? Yeah, and your sister's ugly. Earl Weaver's temper tantrums were something you would look forward to. You ain't either. no good. You're no good either. Hey, yeah, you're you. You'll never have our game to I hope you yeah. would have liked her. This one, however, I think he really lost it. Five, ten years to know who's in the Hall of Fame. Oh, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame. You know it. Why? You in a World Series. You know it. You're going to be in the Hall of Fame. You know it. I've won more than I've lost, kid. I know you haven't. Earl. Games, games, games. games. How do I word this? Bob Knight. Bob Knight is on fire at the telephone over on the scorer's table. I don't think there's anyone who is more passionate than Bob Knight. Knight is throwing a tantrum on the Was that done uh, politically correct there, folks? <laughs> Any kind of discussion about anger management in sports, I think the first guy you got to look at is Bobby Knight. First guy. Ah, uh, so many Bobby Knight moments. So little time. Knight's tantrums were troublesome. They seemed mean. They seemed directed at people who were not his equal. He didn't do a lot of the public relations things for people to run around and want him to kiss their ass. That's not what he is. 
This tirade was directed at an unsuspecting media coordinator after Knight's Indiana team was eliminated in the first round of the 1995 NCAA tournament. ID and the other is me. Who the hell told you I wasn't going to be here? I'd like to know. Do you have any idea who it was? Bobby Knight was frustrated. He lost the game. He's in a foul mood. And some SID just kind of got in the way. And Knight was so ticked off that he beat up on him. They were from Indiana, right? No, weren't from Indiana. And you didn't get it from anybody from Indiana, did you? It was the ultimate form of bullying. Get angry at someone who could not protect himself. No, I'll, do, I'll handle this the way I want to handle it now that I'm here. You f***ed it up to begin with. Now just sit there or leave. I don't give a what you do. That's Knight being a bully. That's why people hate Bobby Knight. Now, back to the game. 11-11. Okay, you didn't think we were going to have only one Knight explosion, did you? February 23, 1985. Indiana was losing at home early to Purdue when Mount Knight erupted after two foul calls against his team. There's the team. It kind of gave us a clip that has, will live forever. Steve Reed, an excellent free throw shooter, will have the honor of shooting the technicals. Looky here, looky here. Bobby Knight just threw his chair. Clear across the free throw lane. Yeah, it's, it's got to be a technical foul. It's got to be expulsion. I didn't know it had to be 5,000 reruns on TV. This has erupted. There's a good chance Bobby Knight's been ejected from this basketball game. Knight was ejected and cost his team three technicals in a 72 to 63 loss. That is what people will think of when they think of Bob Knight, I think. Look at here. Look in a chair. How's that for a legacy? When my time on earth is gone and my activities here are past, I want they bury me upside down and my critics can kiss my ass. <laughs> I've never been really sure what going postal meant, but I always knew what going Hal McRae meant. After losing 12 of the first 19 games of the 1993 season, Royals manager Hal McRae was tired of losing and the stupid questions. That thing that, that upsets managers is getting second-guessed by a guy who probably didn't even play in Little League. Did you consider uh, Brett for Miller with the bases loaded in the seventh? No, no, don't ask me all these stupid-ass questions. At that time, when it happened, I was in the sauna. And I came out, and I'm getting dressed now, and somebody said, God, did you hear what Hal did? Find the f*** without basketball, fuck Miller. You think I'm a damn fool? I'm all these I've never seen anyone throw a phone. You know, that, that might have been a message to the GM, like, don't call me, I'm in the middle of something. He deserved it to throw things around because they weren't playing very well and they weren't getting with it. No s*** for you guys, no s*** for you players. And you, they can do any mother thing they want to do. I'm sick and tired of all this bullshit. I was leaving the locker room and I said, Hal, I heard what happened, can you do it again? And Hal started laughing and all he said was, I don't have enough energy. I've expelled all my energy for the night. Put that in your pocket, folks. Larry Holmes did like a jump off the top turnbuckle, <laughs> but it was actually off the hood of a car. It shows you the mentality of a boxer that's been scorned. On April 7, 1991, after Larry Holmes scored a first round TKO in Hollywood, Florida, he said he wouldn't fight Trevor Burbick, who had attended the bout. A snub Burbick lashed out in front of the cameras. Money don't make a champion, don't make a man. You got to have mom and think it you what you do. That I Trevor Burbick is a total head case. I mean a total head case. Jenny, who live in Jacksonville, and she ain't nothing but a call girl, so. made a comment about Larry's girlfriend in front of Larry's wife. When word of Burbick's allegations were relayed to Holmes in a nearby hotel suite, he came down and pursued Burbick out into the street. Larry Holmes, keep me. Burbick was frightened to death at the prospect of an angry Larry Holmes. <laughs> Whose car was that, and did he ever get reimbursed? You know, how do you submit a claim form to Don King going, excuse me, one of your fighters jumped on my hood. I need to get an estimate. Well, 
was one of the more hilarious boxing fights away from the ring that we've ever seen because no one really got hurt. Never seen anybody with that sort of sustained hysteria. Tell me what I said to abuse you. It's okay. You've seen people lose their minds. You've seen people who've done awful things, but nobody would just carry it on the way that McEnroe did. I'm not playing on until you get the referee. Maybe that's why no one wants to watch men's tennis anymore. There's none of the extracurricular stuff. You're pathetic. You know that? And then he couldn't figure out how to quit, and so he, he just would keep on rolling. Yeah, I guess I have a bad temper. On November 4, 1984, in a semifinal of the Stockholm Open, John McEnroe staged one of his rants and rages, including an assault on a courtside tray of drinks. Smash, right? You have an open on No mistakes whatsoever. Sick as hell, please. Answer my question! The question, jerk! This wasn't even a major tournament. I mean, to think that McEnroe could get so enraged about something like the Stockholm Open shows you that every time he took the court, no matter where it was, he was playing for keeps. And he sat down, and he stood up again, and he hit it a couple of more times. The royal box is right behind him. So the prime minister and the king were there. They were all just so... I don't think it was anywhere near as bad as, like, people sort of make it out to be. It's just a sport. McEnroe won his match against Andres Jared and was fined 2100 bucks, putting him over the season limit and costing him a three-week suspension. You can see what's going on in this world. When you're telling me when I'm hitting a ball in the court, I mean, people like you are absolute idiots, man. John doesn't have a moral leg to stand on to criticize anybody about attitude. Next question. Seven, 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 seven. Billy Martin. The Yankee clubhouse in the Martin year was one of constant tension. This was Billy. He always had to be fighting in some way. Uh, he was suspicious. He, he was contentious. On June 18, 1977, the Yankees' Reggie Jackson was summarily pulled from right field by incensed manager Billy Martin. Would accused him of loafing. For whatever the reason, he did, they didn't like each other. They both had big egos. As I recollect, it was Paul Blair who went out to replace him, and Blair knew there was going to be trouble. That's embarrassing, Reggie. He's a Hall of Famer. You don't do that. Billy accused me of loafing, and I remember extending my arms to, like, what are you talking about? Billy was really upset. Look at Elston get between once and make sure they're at uh, no lower struck down there. Then he told me he was going to kick my ass. I looked at him like, the alcohol you're drinking must be going to your head. And then he really flew off. Billy wants to get at Reggie. Yeah, that's in full view of the crowd being restrained by Yogi Berra and Elston Howard. And I really thought that Billy might pick up a bat and split Reggie's head open. I mean, that's how angry he was by that time. Elston Howard, as his now Billy gets around, but now Yogi's got him. And trying to wrestle him down, Yogi's got him. That kind of, I think, typified what the whole Bronx Zoo was about. And I think it also shows you don't have to have a lot of harmony on a team uh, to be a championship team. Despite the hostility, the Yankees won the pennant and beat the Dodgers in the World Series with Jackson belting five homers, three in one game. In a fight between Billy Martin and Reggie Jackson, although I would hope that Reggie would win, I'd bet on Billy. Ladies and gentlemen, Lewis versus Tyson is on. See, the problem was Tyson press conferences were more exciting than Tyson fights. Iron Mike Tyson. See, they should have been charging for the press conference Lennox Lewis. and giving the fights away for free. Mike Tyson's press conference melee on January 22nd, 2002 was instant. It began without warning and without warm up. Most of that stuff I usually think is orchestrated beforehand. Except in the case of Mike Tyson, they don't have to tell him to do crazy stuff. A member of the media suggested a straitjacket for the former champ, and so was another fuse. And it was one of those kind of perfect Mike Tyson flare-ups. <laughs> 
which people love to watch, but when you're in the presence of, can be kind of frightening. You can't touch me, you're not mad enough. I'll eat your Oh, anybody in here can't with this man, buddy. This is the ultimate, man. There was something there you never quite knew. A shiver came over, you thought, oh my God, this guy can kill me. Come on, you scared coward. You got a man in the like, yo, Mike, man, where's your medication? Like, what happened to the Zoloft, man? Like, you know, somebody get to do the lollipop or something, man. He needs to chill out, man. I think if the guy was closer, he would have, might have committed murder. <laughs> so every now and then, I kick your f ass and stomp on you and put some kind of pain or inflict some kind of pain on you because you deserve to feel the pain, somewhat of the pain that I feel. You can't be surprised about anything Mike Tyson does. I mean, anybody would put a tattoo on his face. <laughs> you know, you got to be a little concerned about it. If you went to see McEnroe play and there wasn't a tantrum, I, I would think you felt cheated. I like the referee. I'm I've talked a lot with John off camera since. You can just feel him cringe because he knows every time we go to Wimbledon, someone, or usually us, is going to replay his tirades at center court. You know, when he looked back at some of his matches, most of the time he complained, he was usually right. I said, even the pits of the world, that's exactly what he is. Who even uses that phrase, the pits of the world? At Wimbledon in 1981, in a first-round match against Tom Gullickson, John McEnroe disputed a line call with a profanity-laced tyrant. Look, you can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious! That ball was on the line. Shaw flew up. It was clearly hit. I think the thing that made that one so unbelievable was it was at Wimbledon. In this hallowed ground, you know, where people were bowing and curtsying. It just seemed so wonderfully out of place. How many you can miss? He's walking over, everyone knows it's in this whole stadium, and you pull it out? Explain that to me, will you? I'm sorry, I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Because the ball was on this side of the court. The and it, came on, and it doesn't matter. I don't think he ever did it intentionally. I don't think he ever sat around and said, okay, now I'm gonna lose my cool. And he wouldn't go on about it quite so much. I just think that he was uh, a rich brat, badly brought up. You guys are the absolute pits of the world, you know that? He was fighting his demons every, almost every time he walked out on the court. I'm going to award a point against you, Mr. McEnroe. Tennis fans of the 80s, uh, certainly I was one of them, we didn't just want to see good tennis, we wanted to see the characters. McEnroe was a character. We're not going to have a point taken away because this guy's an incompetent fool. You know that? That's what he is. That's what he is. Right? Though he went on to win the championship, McEnroe lost the point and was fined 1500 bucks. First gangster of tennis is our boy John McEnroe. You gotta love a guy that could express himself that way on the court and not really care. Yes, he would push players around in practice. Yes, he was volatile. Power is a wonderful, wonderful intoxicant, and I think there were times when Woody Hayes was just absolutely drunk with power. Listen, I'm gonna guard him. On December 29, 1978, with his Ohio State team trailing 17-15 late in the Gator Bowl, an enraged Woody Hayes punched Clemson linebacker Charlie Bauman, who had intercepted a Buckeye pass. He was furious that Sleister had thrown the interception in the first place. Uh, he was angry with the way things were going in the game. I believe Coach Hayes felt that he was flaunting it. This guy's never had a ball thrown to him before in life. He was just happy jumping up and down, not to rub it in and not to be unsportsmanlike. I don't think Woody thought about his career at that time. I don't think he thought about the circumstances. There was no thinking done. You tell me, where can you do that in society and not get arrested? The 65-year-old Hayes, who had won 238 games and three national titles, was fired the next day. He never coached again. The next morning, Coach Hayes got on the microphone and basically said that I'm no longer going to be your coach. And you could have heard a pin drop the entire way back. Later, Charlie Baum picked up the phone, and it was Woody Hayes. And 
And it wasn't an apology. But what do you want to know what the play was? It was an apology without apologizing. A guy that had given of his life to Ohio State, to see him have to leave Ohio State that way was a very sad day for me. I'm from Brownville, Brooklyn. I'm not afraid of nobody. Your hands are registered weapons. You're a killer. You're Mike Tyson. Then you decide to dip on the guy's ear. I thought, what if he'll jump up and go like that and jump around until he bit me, he bit me. And then he bit him again. I think that's a little odd. You know, everybody calls Mike Tyson a pit bull. My man thought the Van der Holyfield's ear was like some kibbles and bits. Mike, all due respect. Ah, Snossages. Just don't kill me, Mike. <laughs> On June 28, 1997, seven months after losing his heavyweight title to Evander Holyfield, a desperate Mike Tyson turned Holyfield into a Las Vegas buffet. He thought, uh-oh, this is going to be exactly the same as the first one now. I don't know what to do. i got to get out of here. Everybody talk about the bad neighborhood he came from, but I came from the bad neighborhood, too. And my first thought was to bite him back. I go over to Mike's corner, and I heard him say it was a punch. I turned and I said, bull man, you bit him. Tyson was disqualified, and the Nevada Athletic Commission suspended his license for a year and levied a $3 million fine. But the perception of Tyson was not a guy who quit. The perception was, what a savage guy. Two, 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 two. You can't run in on another man's press conference and say, I will kick your ass, I will kill you. Hey, 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 hey. And you got to remember, when an old black dude says he's going to kick your ass in a press conference, you better think it's going to happen. Temple coach John Chaney is known for his raspy voice and his vehement disagreements with refs. How can you have three blind mice on a basketball court? On February 13, 1994, after the number eight ranked Owls lost to UMass, Chaney stormed into the press conference of Minutemen coach John Calipari, spewing profanity and threats. You get a hell of a job right here today. Good job. You can't get that job. You're the president. Shut up. You're the president. You're the president. You're the president. I'm killing you. I can still see players coming in the room without their shirts on because they run out of the locker room when they heard Chaney get into this. And I thought, I thought it's still my kid to knock your fing kid in the mouth. Man, John just went too far. Temple suspended him for the next game. Three days after the incident, an embarrassed and tearful Chaney issued a public apology. So here it is in all its ugly, raging, ranting glory the worst of the worst, the colossus of failed anger management. Number one. One, 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 one. And I said, you know what? If he calls me out for using too much pine tar on my bat, I'll run out there and I'll kill one of those guys. Yes. He's out. Yes, sir. That's like fighting out. You're in love with somebody, and they cheated on you at your wedding. And a demon man. God, that. If they hadn't gotten between them, he would have he slugged that umpire, and one wonders what they would have done then. Forcibly restrained. You want anger management? He needed anger management. The Yankees have won the ball game. In 1983, the Yankees' Craig Nettles had noticed pine tar slathered on George Brett's bat. It was an ace in the hole he filed away. I knew the rule was there because uh, Munson had been called on it a couple years earlier. Nettles had been telling the Yankees, let's just wait, just wait, just wait. When he does something really important, let's get it. The tying run is at first base and two out. In the ninth inning, July 24th, the Yankees led the Royals by a run. Uh-oh, uh-oh. That's gone. The George clock's one. It's gone. Drop my head's dog on it. Kansas City's all happy, and Billy Martin confronts him. Billy Martin and the Yankees want the bat. He was going to make something happen. George Brett looking around and wanting to know what's going on, and the umpires are going to get together and talk about this thing. And everybody's saying, did you cork your bat on the dugout? I said, no, I didn't. I'm not corking my bat. Well, Brett isn't sure whether he has a home run yet or not. The pine tar ruling never came up until he laid the bat across home plate. I've never seen this. And George is well beyond that. I mean, you can get a hit on the meat part of the bat and come up with pine tar on it. They might call George Brett out. Well, he yeah, is. He's, he's out. Yes, sir. He's out. Look at, look at this. Brett is out. And Demon Mag. He is out. And having to be forced.
forcibly restrained from hitting plate umpire Tim McClellan. What he saw was a truly mentally ill jerk, Billy Martin, coming out to steal something from him. Four days later, American League President Lee McPhail upheld the Royals' protest and allowed the home run to stand. The remainder of the game was ordered replay, and KC's 5-4 lead held up. George knows he's really lucky he didn't get suspended. In the NBA, that's a definite charge. I got to the ballpark today, and now Zeke was going through my bat supply, and he picked out the best one I had, and he went up 18 inches, and we drew a little line with a little pen, and we're going to keep it below the line. <laughs> So all that's left now is to sift through the smoke and rubble and find out what our resident second guessers, Burt Randolph Sugar and the Schwab himself, Howie Schwab, think of ESPN Classics ranking of those in desperate need of a hug. Word is that in debating these, these two actually ended up in therapy themselves. Gentlemen, the time is yours. Anger management. You cannot be serious. I think anger management is something over a period of time, like Billy Martin, 19 fights, fighting his own players, Jim Brewer, Matt Batts, Ed Witts, and you name it. The great thing about Billy Martin, he fought more times in one stretch than Tyson did for three years. It's not a bad line. I'll steal it. Hey, but you <laughs> but you've got, you think it's one particular wow. moment. Well, now that's an interesting debate. Uh, is right. anger management I'm ready over, for the, it. Okay, over the course <laughs> of history, or is it... Over one incident, when you talk about Mike Tyson, you can talk about a number of things, anything from trying to break Franz Botha's arm to, of course, the Holyfield ear to Orlin Norris to you name it, you got it. I mean, Tyson, sure, there's a litany of things. Well, I'll tell you what, let's talk about Woody Hayes because here's a guy who won 205 games at Ohio State, won three national championships, won 13 Big Ten titles, one of the greatest football coaches of all time, period. But most people, or most younger people today, Think about the one incident against Clemson. With Charlie yeah. Bauman. Charlie Bauman, and that's it. And, and it's well, a shame. because it shows up continually sure. in, in the clips. But there you are. One situation, one anger management situation overshadows a, a fantastic career, and it's a shame. I, uh, I, I feel one snap does not a summer make, stealing an old line. True, but I feel that because this list has a number of situations where the one incident where you snap you do need anger management because the incident is so bad like a George Brett or a Woody Hayes or a John McEnroe well again John McEnroe He's a constancy but and I don't think his was anger management question he was playing a very good game of one-upsmanship well I think with him it was anger management at times because I think he was so emotional in the middle of a match I think that and I also think he tried to motivate himself I think a lot of times when he got angry at calls he was frustrated with himself as well, that he felt he could play at a different level. And at times, that affected him. Well, anger management, I think, before we both get angry with each other, is about done. I'm going to see my therapist right now. I'll be right back. You know what? I'm going to have a drink and celebrate. <laughs> well, the second guessers have had their say. It's time to see how you, the fan, voted on Sports Nation on ESPN.com for the greatest anger management of all time. Number five, Kenny Rogers shoves cameraman. Number four, John McEnroe, profanity lace tirade. Number three, Dennis Rodman headbutts ref. Number two, Bob Knight throws chair. Number one, Mike Tyson bites Evander Holyfield's ears. So that'll do it for this edition of Who's Number One. Thanks for joining us for ESPN Classics ranking of the 20 greatest anger management failures of all time. We will be back to continue our countdown of the teams, the athletes, and the events that have shaped our sports world. Until then, I'm Trey Wingo. Let the debating begin.